Hello, hello. This is Roxana Bangura of the Roxana Bangura channel here on YouTube. Um, buenos tardes. Soy Roxana Bangura. Bienvenido a mi canal. Welcome to my channel. Um, this is also the Bangura Chronicles on Patreon and Facebook. Today I have a really special treat for you, um, a privilege. I'm interviewing my sister here in my, my adopted Pueblo. Her name is Rakia. And she is a veteran immigrant to Mexico. She's been living here uh, more than 10 years in different areas of the, the country. And we'll be talking to her about a variety of subjects. And uh, there she is. I also want you to know that she's the owner and operator of the Welsh English Learning Center. That is one of the premier English learning centers in this region, in our town and in the surrounding areas. And she also teaches uh, Spanish along with her and her husband. All right. Without further ado, without further ado, welcome Rakia. Benvenido, mi hermana. Benvenido. Okay. She's coming up on the camera. Benvenido. Benvenido. Welcome. 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 Benvenido, hermana. Benvenido. Welcome. Benvenido. All right. Um, I gave a little bit of, of a brief intro um, as to who you were and, you know, living here in Mexico for, for over 10 years. So she's well qualified. She's taught me and continues to teach me things about life here, life here as a, a mom, life here as a woman, life here as a black woman. So um, without further ado, I will uh, let Rukia uh, do a brief introduction of herself. And I also mentioned the Wealthy English Learning Center. So Rukia, would you share with us um, who you are? Let us know. Sure. First of all, I do want to say thank you for having me. It is such a pleasure and an honor because I've watched you grow. Gracias. So Gracias proud of you. Gracias a ti. <laughs> I'm super, super proud of you. So with that being said, hello. My name is Rekia, as Roxana has said. Um, I've been in Mexico now 11 years, and I absolutely love it here. It has definitely had its growing pains and continues to have its growing pains. But um, all in all, I'm excited. I, I feel I'm exactly where I need to be, and I'm growing at the speed that I need to be growing. So I can't complain. Um, I've been blessed to start a learning center where we teach different um, languages, idiomas. We teach English, Spanish, and German and French. Right. So um, we are working every day, every day to be more successful because you know the language game abroad is a big one and there is a lot of competition it's so a big, big it is, one. yes it is a big game it is a growing game so especially now that everybody's going online it's so much to be learned it's so it's, it's it's intriguing every day i'm learning something new on how to better my business um i'm i'm wife i'm mom so i'm busy <laughs> i'm busy all the time so you know Let let me dig into let me dig into the Welsh English Learning Center. As I mentioned, um, she has the like one of the highest rankings in our area, in our town, in our surrounding um, city, in our surrounding pueblo. And I want to know what uh, prompted you to become an entrepreneur. What prompted you to start this business? What was the motivation? Well, one thing that I've kind of gotten away from, and a lot of people don't realize or don't remember, is um, I have a bachelor's in science and my background is psychology. So I absolutely love um, digging into people's minds. And when I lived in Nogales, Sonora, um, my ex boss, she asked me on the street to come and work with her. And I was not feeling it because I was all about crossing every day and going to work at the hospital. I was so about my normal. And she sat down with me and she told me, she was like, if you really, really want to be a successful psychologist, I advise that you start with teaching because with teaching, you can get to know so many brains. And I told her, I was like, yes, but there's no schizophrenia, there's no depression. And she was like, ha, that's what you think. There's so many brains that are not diagnosed that you could definitely tap into and you can lead them to getting help. And she unlocked the door for me by giving me this opportunity. I'll never forget it. Um, the school's name is Colegio Miranda. It's still going on. She's still working there. If you're in the north and you're in Sonora, I recommend this bilingual school because it's very hard to get a bilingual school in Mexico, but this one is definitely 100% bilingual. Um, but she opened up this door for me 
And she showed me that psychology is more than sitting down on somebody's couch and telling them your problems. It is much more than um, waiting for somebody to come ask for help. And so when I left Sonora and we moved to that accrued, I did not want to continue to work for anybody because Better Cruz charges way less than the North. I'm talking about the income in Better Cruz is completely different. So I was like, why am I going to sell myself and not make 100% of the profit? And so that is what I had to do. I had to sit down and I had to gather up my nerves because at this present time, I didn't speak Spanish. And mm -hmm. something about Better Cruz is um, the English population is very little and the people who do speak English don't have enough confidence to approach you with English so it's kind of like you know stepping on eggshells when you use the English language here because they would rather speak Spanish to you until they feel comfortable enough to even try to express themselves with English so I did that I did go to work for a school here for about four months and I realized that the quality of education that they were offering was was just not to my standard and i was not willing to sell out because for me it was definitely selling out having to give grades away instead of having the children earn their grades it was like it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't my way of wanting to spend my time it felt like a completely personal compromise personally so let me, um let me interrupt you you said that the quality of education in Veracruz cruz wasn't up to your standard um, can you explain the, the differences between northern Mexico and more central southern Mexico in terms of education that you've experienced, that you've witnessed? Yes, of course. So I'm, very, I'm a very honest person, and I'm just going to speak honestly. <laughs> um, in the north of Mexico, I was privileged to work for a school that was roughly 4,000 pesos a month. And when you think about 4,000 pesos a month, you think about who can afford this type of education. So honestly, my students were she children. The tuition. the tuition was 4,000 pesos a month, which yes. is what, um, under $200? Uh, right now, but when I was there, the dollar was 13 pesos. Oh, wow. So, so that's pretty expensive yeah, it's compared expensive. to now. Exactly. So, um, when you think about the, the, the student client base that they had, my students were politician children or children of um, illegal drug activity or um, people who were in, 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 in more of a, what's the word I'm looking for? They weren't in savory work environments, right? So I do wanna say this. This type of environment, their children are wanting, they are bleeding out for a good education and their parents pay for it. So when I tell you that they come to class on time, they come with their homework, they come with their bodyguards, they come with their nice cars, but they come more, most, most often, they come with the willing and need for a good education, especially when it comes to English and math because they realize that in order for them to take over this type of business, they need to be number one. So they, they reach for it. They literally, I miss this type of environment so much. They, they really pick your brain. You cannot come to their class with apples and oranges because they, I mean, I always tell people, I'm not gonna come to you with unicorns and apples and oranges and I know you have people tied up in your basement. I just know. So I have to come at you with a whole nother perspective. And I did. I, I mean, I was the teacher who today is still in much contact with these students who are now finishing college, your doctors, the lawyers. They, of course, they're part of an uh, unsavory lifestyle because they were born into it. But thankfully, because of their education, they've been able to kind of have another escape route. And, and here in Veracruz, I always call Veracruz the, the kings and queens of Mexico even though they don't really have any thrones <laughs> because they really feel as if they own everything and they really don't. And when I say this, it's not as a shot or to be rude because I, I have grown to appreciate Veracruz. Cruz. It's not one of my favorite places I've lived in Mexico, but due to family ties, I'm here. But the, the education here is lack thereof. People don't like to study. If they have um, economic power, 
they do not enforce that their children are educated at all. They feel like they can buy grades. They feel like they can travel and insult other cultures. They're just, I don't know, they've proven themselves to be very close-minded here in Veracruz Cruz versus Sonora, Sinaloa, Tijuana, where I used to work and live. The, the people who you would think are less than or least than on the education totem pole, no, no, these people are smart as a whip and they're ready. They are ready. And so you're describing, you you're describing two different Mexicos. Yes. Uh, being that the Sonora and, you know, Nayarit, Sonora, those areas are more no northern. How much is it of the, do you think uh, of the American from the United States, how much, how much influence is the United States having on those areas in terms of people being more uh, educationally focused or driven? Um, trabajadores is one of the words we, we use here. Not to say that people aren't in Veracruz, we're not, we're not saying that. But no, what have you seen? Okay, so one thing that I noticed, and I'll never forget this. When I first moved to Mexico, I moved to Tijuana. Okay. And I moved to TJ. Mm -hmm. Yes, I moved to TJ because I was so scared of not being able to go back home. <laughs> so I didn't want to go too far. So I'll never forget that I rented this really nice house on the border. And when I opened the window, what did I see? Gucci, Prada, um, Plaza Las Americas, which is in Chula Vista, California, which is also on the border of like San Diego area. So literally, I saw this big, brown, ugly border wall that has been there forever. And, you know, nobody get overexcited about the border wall. It's been there forever, and it's hideous. And then behind this border wall, because the divisions are, are you can, like, literally see through the division, I seen this very nice lifestyle that as an African-American woman, as a nurse, I could not afford it with the American dollar every day. Okay, and I as was a nurse, hour, as a nurse, as a nurse, nurse make good I was money. Making, yeah. Listen, I was making a hundred dollars an hour before taxes because I was a travel nurse. I do my own 1099s. Um, and I couldn't afford to shop at this big, beautiful plaza that was right on the border. On the Mexican right. side? No, no, it's on the California it's side. Oh, but United States. Clearly, yeah. You can clearly see it opening my window from TJ. I could see it. And it was like a carrot in front of a mouse or a rabbit. I was like, oh my God, I'm I taking see. enough money to go to coach every day and Burberry. I was like, oh my God, I need to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I need to hit this borderline because this weekend I'm going to this plaza. And I think, and I'll never forget, I told my husband, I was like, yo, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing because if you can't cross and you see, I'm talking about Rolls Royces, I'm talking about Bentley, I'm talking about just, it looked like a movie. And I was like, if you can't cross it and touch it and be involved in it, I was like, I see why people are jumping the border because I want to jump the border and I'm legal. I can go back and forth every day. When you ask me if this is an influence on the North, yes. Because now moving from TJ and we moved into Sonora, Sonora's border is dusty. <laughs> it's very dusty. There's not a lot going on. But they have colleges and they do have educational systems all along the line. Like you can see the kids crossing every day, all day. So yes, I strongly believe that our American style, American education is in most, and I do want to make a note that American, America's educational system is not that good. It's not True. that good. Okay. True. But, um, how, how can I put this plainly? The difference here is we still need to have papers, like certificates and degrees to accomplish the jobs that we want. In the United States, yes. So, in the United States, yes. So this makes us push through and do the best that we can with the education that we have at our fingertips. Versus here, I've noticed that you can pay for these positions. So the children don't push so hard to get that, that strong um, academic foundation that they need. It's like, eh, 
Yeah, boy, come from me, plaza. And, and when we're saying here, we're, we're, we're talking about, when we're saying here, we're talking about your experiences in Veracruz. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because at the border, at the border, very seldom do you find a family that says to their child, hey, echale ganas so that you can work here in Mexico. No, that is like, oh, you're working in Mexico? Why? When you should be able to, they kind of qualify life like, oh, you got a job in California. Oh, you got a job in Arizona. You're doing well. Where here in, in, in Veracruz, it's like, oh, yes, that's, you're working for Proquina or, or you're working for Tamsa, which are semen companies or the pharmaceutical company. You're doing well. So the, the border is definitely their standard of living. Their, they, what, they, what they classify as good life is being able to cross to make dollars and come back okay and, and live and live nicely. And, and that's not the reality for for here for central no, mexico, no. southern mexico here, no. here in better cruise a good job is to work for a factory not as a floor man but to have your engineering degree i think i sent you this um there's seven good jobs here in better cruise and most of them are engineering industrial engineering accounting and um civil engineering and our architects, those are the, the top four. And if you get these type of jobs here in Better Cruz, you are, you know, higher standard of life. Okay, okay, all right. Now let me ask you, if you could assign one word to your life in Mexico, what would it be? I don't want to be cliche, but... I don't know, Roxana. I, I don't know if I can use one word. Um, I want to say two words. Okay. I want to say learning experience. And I would like to draw on this, if you let me. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I moved to Mexico, kind of a truth of dare situation. Um, when I say truth or dare, because my life in the United States was good, but I fell in love with a man who was Mexican. And at this time, I was super ignorant to the immigration laws. When I say super ignorant, I can't tell you that I thought Mexico was free, but I thought Mexico was free because I came in and out of Mexico on college trips and nobody ever said anything to me. So I would definitely classify myself as a stupid, educated american i was in my box a, a, a my lot mom. of us a lot of us were yes all i, I knew I, about mexico was cancun yeah That's all I knew. <laughs> spring break cancun exactly to, and, yeah you are it's absolutely a shame. right it's a Very shame much so. mm -hmm. i you know i went to college in arizona so we would go to rocky point or san carlos fin de semana get wasted and cross back over i'm talking about I would be passed out in a car. Nobody would ever wake me up to ask me for a paper. So when I tell you that I had no earthly idea about immigration policies in Mexico when I fell in love, oh my God, I feel like, why? But I fell in love and um, I think I talked to you about this one. The Dole Company in Oregon did the most shystest thing I could ever remember. Dole, and, you hear that? Dole. <laughs> oh, I don't buy from them. They listen. They can't sell me a pineapple. They can't give it to me for free. So, um, when I tell you that they did the most shyest thing I've ever heard of, they they literally like grouped in all of their immigrants and had them deported. And I was literally watching the news. And I remember my husband at this time. He's my boyfriend working, and he worked from eight in the morning to like eleven at night. And you know, me being all high sedity, I only had my three days a week. And I was like, all right, I'm going to just watch the news, kick back my dinner. And I seen that they had deported like thousands of people in one day. I'm talking about kids were left at school. Um, wives, husbands were like, where's my wife? Where's my husband? What is going on? And not only did they deport them, but they took them out of the state of Oregon. They took them over to Montana, Utah. They were just dispersing them around so that they, they could not communicate with their family. And so when my husband, or at the time, my boyfriend came home, and I asked him, I was like, yo, what's up with your papers? What is this paper thing? What does Mexican need these papers about? What Can you explain this to me? And his face looked like, 
a deer in headlights. Like, you know, like he looked at me as if he forgot that he loved me and that ice was going to pop out of the closet. And I was oh like, goodness. yes. So you guys like, hadn't had this conversation prior to this point? No, because it was like, I mean. It was a non-issue until you saw the news. For me. And, and, you know, honestly, you know, we talked about it a thousand of times now. And he was like, I wasn't embarrassed to talk to you about it, but I was like, well, if she doesn't ask, I'm not going to say anything. Because it could be used as a double-edged sword. If we don't work out, I could have him deported. Or if we do work out, you know, we could get married and fix the paper situation, right? So, and he didn't want it to look like he was just interested in me for papers, you know? So I can understand that now, but when it, when he brought it to the table, we brought it to the table together and he explained to me how papers work. And he explained it to me like CNN, right? Now. And I mean, he broke it down and he never put himself in the situation until I asked, I was like, so do you have papers? And then he was like, no. Nah. When I was talking about a guy who has been in the United States, I want to say he was in the States for a good seven or eight years prior to meeting me. And I'm talking about traveling all from New York, California to Oregon, no papers, no nothing. And um, and he was like, no, I don't have a paper. And I was like, oh. So if the police stop you, am I going to just lose you forever? And he was like, well, it could happen. And I was like, oh, no, what do we do? So we went to the lawyer the next day because I'm like this. I was like, we're going to see an attorney. And the attorney explained to me, um, yeah, y'all have to move. Just like that. And that I was, was like, the only option? That yeah, was the only said, option? He was like, yeah, because he's already here and he's illegal, so you can't marry him and him stay here. You can marry him and then he has to go to Mexico and you have to apply for him, da da da. And I was like, okay, so if I get married here and have to send him away, that just doesn't sound logical to me. Who wants to get married and then send their husband away? And I was like, all right, well, what do we do? He was like, well, I'm a travel nurse. Let's travel. So my whole family was like, I bet you won't. I bet you won't go to Mexico. And you know, here's what we're not going to do. So, how did your family receive that news? I mean, what? I mean, my they did it. They did it. I don't think. I think that when my son was born, he's five. I think that's when it kind of hit them that she's not coming back. So, <laughs> um, literally, they were like, "Oh, she's not going to make it down there." They were like, "I can't believe you're going to throw away your degree. I can't believe you're just going to just give up on everything." Because at this time, I'm a travel nurse, but I had just secured a good position at Oregon State Hospital in their psych department. I was the head of the psych department at 24. So my family, you know, you know our family, they are like all big on these fancy titles and, you know, this is what you've been working for and you're going to put it all in your trash can for this thing called love. Are you crazy right now? And, you know, we had just got this really nice condo and everybody's like, you're going to do what? You're just going to do what? Education and career over everything. That's, that's over the, everything. the culture and value. I, exactly. And, and I, I had to take, like I said, it was truth or dare. Like, what is your truth? Are you really in love? Or you are you going to dare to be different? Um, are you going to stay in a country that doesn't show love for you and who you love? Because, you know, I, I learned early on that as an African-American woman in the United States, and I and, and I classify as an African-American woman wholeheartedly, but I also use mixed because, you know, my background is tremendous. So with all these titles that have been attached to me and with no love being shown, I was like, why am I here? Why? Why? Why am I here? What am I missing out on in the world? And so we got in the, the car literally to... The two suitcases, one dog, and a television and drove from Portland, Oregon to, Ter to Tijuana. That was and it. You moved. That was it. I moved. It took me 72 hours. 72 hours. We went to the lawyer. You the moved to day. another country in 72 hours. 72 hours. Oh I literally, God. we went to the lawyer. The next day, I quit my job. What? Yes. The next day, I quit my job. The next day we started driving. So let me ask you, let, let's backtrack because I mean, you were young, you quit your job. How did you think you were going to sustain yourself economically? What were this you thinking? Um, my thing was, well, I'm going to get a job at the local hospital in Tijuana. Ignorance. This is stupidity. But, um, and if that doesn't work, because I didn't speak Spanish at all. 
So if that didn't work, I was like, yeah, I'll go to work in California. This is the mentality of a travel nurse. You know, I'm, I was never big on staying in one facility for a long time because I get bored. So I was like, yeah, I like to drive. I'll just cross over every morning. No biggie. And that's what I did. When we moved, I had my nursing license switched over to California. Okay. I applied here in Tijuana at the hospital called Los Angeles. <laughs> and they offered me a job. But the technology, or should I say lack thereof technology, was so bad that I was like, I can't. The, in, I'm in, gonna the, in Tijuana? In Tijuana. And this I was is like, northern Mexico, right across the border from California. Okay. Yes, but we, we are talking 11 years ago. Mexico has made some growth. It has grown leaps and bounds. When I see, for example, when I see you and other um, um, entrepreneurs that are here, I'm like, oh my God, when I came into Mexico, this whole online situation, girl, you was lucky to get a good stream of internet. So <laughs> when I tell you that things have changed, things have changed wholeheartedly because literally I, I remember coming over here and it was a battle to get, I had T-Mobile phone service. When you crossed over the border, that was it. Your phone didn't work for the next two blocks. Like, really? Literally, you crossed over the border and there went your bars. Oh there was goodness. no roaming because there was no service. Wow. And when you got to your house, you know, we always had Telmex. People are complaining about Telmex internet. Yeah. Telmex internet was, 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 ooh. <laughs> it was, it was like Fred Flintstone in the inside your modem, walking the system. So... <laughs> When, you know, I'm growing now. I'm still learning. So I'm saying Mexico is learning for me because I'm learning from all you newcomers to Mexico on how to do this internet thing, how to not be shy in front of the camera because this is new to me. It's, it's new when, when people are like, oh, she's American. She's, no, baby. I've been to Mexico but you so moved, long. But you moved to a new country in 72 hours. Yes, ma'am. So, yes, yeah. So you bold, yes. you bold as brass. You bold I, I, as brass. No plan. Listen, I yeah, found a my new, house. A new country. Granted, you know, same landmass, but Mexico is a whole new, and you don't, not speaking Spanish. With no Además. passport. Como? With no, with no passport. You didn't have a passport? No, ma'am. I moved to How Mexico. How did that you went without a passport? I'm telling you, when I moved here, you could just cross over. There was no passport. There was no papers being checked. There was nothing. I got my passport in Mexico City. <laughs> okay. When I moved to this country and I would go across Your driver's the license? Your driver's license. My driver's license. Oh my word. I was able to walk in and out of this country every single day. I was able to drive in and out of this country every single day with just my driver's license. So you were crossing with just your driver's license. Working yes. in working where in Arizona, California, because you're a traveling nurse. So where, yes. where are you working at this point? In California, I was working at a nursing home, and then from there I would have assignments at the hospital in San Diego. So you were hustling. Yes. Black and woman yes. hustling, making it do what it do. Yes, yes, ma'am. So let me I'm ask you, how was the transition for your husband? Because I'm an immigrant to Mexico. So I'm striving, you know, I'm, I have goals that I, I, I want to achieve, you, you know, with my daughter, with myself. It would be, it would probably send me into a depression if I had to go back to the United States. Very much so. I know it will. It's not even, I know that it would feel like I've regressed. I have strived these three years to come here and to, to fight my way, you know, to, to, to make a life here. To go back to the United States would be a depression. It would, I would be depressed. Yes. It would be. So how how did that? How did you maneuver your day to day? Because well, he couldn't come. He couldn't just pop over like you could. No. You you were the you were the bridge. So how did how did you maneuver with that? Okay, that, that's an excellent question. And I where was, he at? He, he, where my he husband at? is he downstairs, girl, with his Netflix. You know, we're on vacation. He's not about this computer life today. <laughs> So, um, so here's another ignorant thing of me that I can accept 11 years later. 
I didn't take my husband's feelings into consideration at all. I decided to move in 72 hours and my husband loving me unconditionally was like, all right, I don't want to be without you and I don't want you to worry about me being deported or mistreated. So I'm with it. We moved to Tijuana and it was hell Rata, for him. My husband is not classified as a poor Latino or Mexican. His family has economic stability. But y'all better stop stereotyping people going into Mexico. Yeah. Everyone has a poor people come from all different economic levels and social strata. Yes, my, my husband's family actually were one of the first families here in Veta Cruz to bring in the lottery. So they have economic stability. Um, but what he didn't want is to be in a small town. And that's where he's from. It's growing now, thank God. But the town was tremendously small. So when he left his small town in Veracruz, Cruz, he moved to Tijuana. And when he realized Tijuana was still small, Tijuana now is a metropolis. But it used to just be a border crossing city that was dusty. It all get up. Americans only came to drink and party and mess things up and go back to the United States. And Tijuana would be left with just dust and broken bottles. So when he crossed, when we crossed over, I was excited. I was like, oh my God, I'm new in a foreign land. And he was like, oh my God, you're new in a foreign land and I have to now put my life on the line to take care of you. Because if something happens to you in my country, your family is going to want to kill me. And I had no idea dollar pay still, peso ratio. Mm -mm. I had no idea that a hundred dollars was going to triple, but you would spend it in one day. Wait a minute, please. I had zero, zero, zero idea of this. So when I tell you that his, his weight of the change was way different than mine because I was literally on vacation mentally for a long time where he wasn't. And he was in a state of depression that we now talk about for a good three years coming back to Mexico. There you because, go. <laughs> yeah. Hey. I think he forgot that we were, we were meeting. Tell him I said hi. He can hear you. Hi, Ivan. Mean. <laughs> so I think that he, you know, I don't know because we talked about this. He was in a state of depression. He couldn't find a job that he felt would sustain us economically like he did back home, which was a major thing for him because I'm talking about a man who was making 150, 200 in tips every day to coming to Tijuana and making nickels. Yeah. And that would I make was, anyone depressed. Anyone. Very much so. Yeah. And and being that I was a princess from the gate, he was just like, I don't even know how to take care of you here. So we went through this and I was like, Don't worry, I'm making good money. I'm traveling. And he's like, Yeah, but I'm the man. And I'm not supposed to live off of what you bring. I'm supposed to provide for you. And that's when we lived in the States. You know, all my money was for purses and manicures and nonsense. And he paid all the bills. And now the tables were turned. And let me tell you this. As an African-American woman, I want to touch on this. We kind of have this thing. We're good with taking care of things for a good four to six months. But this mouth of ours is reckless when we're taking care of things. Now, this thing gets reckless. It, gets it reckless sure can money. be. <laughs> so this was reckless. I was like, hey, I'm doing this, this, and this. And my ex this, said this, my this. mouth was like a, a Gillette blade. He said my yeah. mouth was like a Gillette blade. It gets <laughs> reckless. So I had to dial it back. I had to dial it back. I was like, you can't be throwing up in your face or his face what you're doing. Because I was digging at that confidence of his. And I'm telling you, it got really hard. I remember one day he, he just looked at me and he was like, well, 
I'm going to take you to the border and don't come back. Whoa. Because, yeah, he was like, I'm going to take you to the border, but don't come back because I cannot afford to take care of you and you're not going to make me feel like less than a man. I'll figure out how to meet you. On or He was like, I'm going to cross again. He was like, I'll figure that out. And when I cross again, I'll call you. And I was like, oh, okay. I sit down and we need to put this together and we need to come up with a plan. And this is when we moved to Veracruz the first time. We left Tijuana because, like I said, it was it was dusty. <laughs> there was not a really good life there. It was it was rock star. Tijuana was rock star when we were living. And I was like, well, we can't just keep partying every day. So we moved to Veracruz the first time, and I'll, I'll tell you this right now. We drove from Tijuana to Veracruz, which is oh my um, word, that's a long drive. Yes, you know we absolutely love driving. So we jumped in the truck and we drove down, and we passed these houses that look like huts. And he was like, he, he played a really big trick on me. He was like, yeah, we're here. He pulled over next to these houses. Huts? Girl, it was huts. And I was like, we here where? And he was like, <laughs> he was like yeah, get out the car so you can meet my mom and dad and my sister. <laughs> and I was like, what? I was like, get out the car. I was like, get out the car and do That's what? hilarious. That's hilarious. That was a good one. And he was like, nah, this is where I live. This is where I'm from. You want to come to Mexico? This is where I'm from. This is where you go. Girl, the sheep walked across me. The sheep, bad, walked across. And I was like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to live here. I was like, nope, you're going to turn this car back around. We're going to go somewhere between T1 and Veracruz. And we're going to settle down somewhere. But we're not going to live in Veracruz. But it was a joke. We kept driving another two hours. And we made it to his family's house whole house. We're talking about whole house, running water, no animals, because like I think he had his family is economically stable. So everything was good. And I was like, all right, phew, phew. It's like cause you almost got me. But um we, we stayed in Better Cruz, I want to say a year. And I didn't like it. I couldn't so adjust. How was that transition from Tijuana to Vera Cruz the first time? Horrible. Why? I'll tell you, uh, um, because the town that we moved to was so be befi- it was way it was just black and white to me i'm not talking about physically black and white i'm talking about the mentality my husband and i were used to going out together playing pool together dancing all night i'm talking about partying up on the beach and we moved to a town that he literally was like you can't go here because if you go here, they're going to think you're a prostitute because women don't go out here. And I'm like, what? And then we move in this same town because his family's popular. I would go to the grocery store by myself because I'm talking about I'm independent. And people would be like, where's your husband? What are you doing outside? Mm-hmm. Then, yes, yeah. Then when I'll never forget his sister had her birthday and i was like let's go to the bar girl they would not serve me until my husband was informed that i was at the bar so that as you know didn't work for me i was like "Uh uh-uh now it's one thing to control this reckless mouth it is another thing to put shackles on me because that's what we do now we just shackling me i can't go outside without somebody asking me where you are um, I didn't have my Mexican driver's license. Which as if you're someone's crazy. property, you know, it's as if you're someone's property. Ridiculous. Exactly. Because in, in the North, you, you don't need a Mexican driver's license if your car has American plates. Okay. And they don't bother you as much as an American driving in the North. But once you could get into Mexico City, you better make sure your paperwork is together. On that car, you gotta make sure your paperwork is together with your your travel visas and better cruise also. So it wasn't like I could just hop in my car. Now it's in my name, you know. I didn't got my Mexican paperwork on it because we drove there. I was like, make sure the papers were correct. But I couldn't just drive it like I wanted to because everywhere I go, they would stop. And remember, I didn't speak Spanish, so it was easy for them to ask me for money and let me go on my way. So it was just like, mm, I just couldn't, I couldn't stomach Vera Cruz the first go around because I wasn't mature enough to understand 
what a woman's place is supposed to be here in Better Cruz. And um, and I'm talking about I didn't have any children and I was still buck wild. So I wasn't trying to hear staying in the house Monday through Sunday and just going to the beach to go salsa dancing on the weekend. I, I just wasn't about that life. So we stayed here a year. I didn't work. He did work and he, you know, he was able to sustain us because like I said, he worked for his family and it worked well. But it wasn't my lifestyle. And I was like, I'm this is too much. So we left and we went to Sonora. I was like, I need to go back to the border. I need to be able to get I told you my thing was milk, Roxana. I could not find milk and a gallon jug in the grocery store here and I was not happy about it. <laughs> Everything was You were not trying to adjust. I was adjust, adapt. It was just like uh it was out of my mind it, it was blown once they made me feel like an inadequate woman i was not able to accept anything else from these people. I, when i say these people i mean mexico in a whole i was done i was like take me back to the border we can be together but i'm going over to arizona every day every day you, I you need your american fix you need your yes. american fix i need oh. my american fix how much, you know, how much the people that you encountered moving here, you know, your in-laws, your suegros, and your, you know, the community, how much of them did they, I guess, did they understand that obviously you weren't of the culture? How much allowance did you get for that? Meaning, okay, this woman, you know, these, these are not the cultural norms for her, you know, dictating her, where, her, her goings and comings and her having to be escorted and getting permission. This is not something that is that she grew up with. This is not a part of her value system, her culture. Do you think there was any room for an understanding? Like, okay, it was like, hey, this is the way we do it, and that's just the way it's done. No. No, not, not And is that I still very prevalent uh, 11 years later? Very much so. Um, one thing that I think we have to understand as Americans, is we landed on them they didn't land on us so they don't they don't try to understand my strife they don't try to understand me not speaking spanish they don't try to understand me being privileged because at the end of the day that's exactly what it is it's a privilege that I am free mentally and physically because I came to a country that suffers machismo. And a lot of people think machismo comes from the man, but machismo comes from the woman. How do you the say woman, how? how? Yes, let me tell you. When a man child is born here in Mexico, the woman tells that man, don't take out the trash, I'll do it. The woman tells that child, don't cook dinner, I'm going to cook it. Don't wash your clothes, I'm going to wash it. I don't know if it is a sense of, let me take care of you, or it's a sense of, you need to go outside and work so you won't have to do this at home. I don't know where it comes from. But I do know that most of the men I have encountered, including my husband, are taught what? By their mothers, and oh. most of the men that I have encountered, including my husband, are taught by their grandparents, their mothers, their bisabuelas, that they don't have to do certain things because this is a woman's job. So women um, promote women a, a prop uh -huh, promote they propped up uh, machismo patriarchy. Yes, is that that's what you're saying? I, I do. I believe that. I don't know if they have ever thought about it in this manner, but I, I'm going to tell you this. My father-in-law is one of the men that I have noticed does not believe that men can't do certain things. But my mother-in-law, on the other hand, thinks that her son should not wash his own clothes, <laughs> should not grab a broom. Now, my father-in-law will do everything around the house without a problem. But my yes. mother-in-law, like I said, doesn't believe that her kid, her, her son should do such a thing. And that was a big issue. But her, if her husband is doing it, you know, it's not making sense. If her husband is doing it, yeah. yeah that's exactly what I said. 
but yeah. the, 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 thing, the thing here was why is my son with a woman who feels like she does not have to do these things and it wasn't like i felt like i shouldn't it was just like we're in an equal opportunity marriage here like my father-in-law taught me this he says Se va a hacer con los manos, no con los huevos. Entonces, si pueden hacer, meaning he's going to do it with his hands, not his nut. He can do it. It's not a problem. And this is something that I teach my son all the time. I'm like, listen, I need for you to make sure that you can sustain yourself so that way you don't just marry because you're looking for somebody to take care of you. It's called adulting. <laughs> exactly. I want to make sure that if, if you go, not if, but when you go outside, you will be able to sustain you know but this is this is a different thing this is a culture thing like for me I, I i know people who still live at home with their mother they're married they have children and the, the mom is still in the house or they're still in oh the house. and that's common that's common throughout. yeah in laws stay and together it, families stay together yes yes but and you know that's there can only be here, one queen that's that's my mentality this and see this, this is stuff listen this conversation this will probably have to be a whole nother video but uh, this conversation is where our cultures divide <laughs> because I also grew up with, there's only one queen in this castle, but here in Mexico, everybody's a queen, princess, we all equal. The king, the, the prince, I mean, you even got the joker in the house. Everybody <laughs> is just motioning and I'm just like, <laughs> And, you, and, and listen, I grew up in a household, my mother's been married six times, my grandma seven. So for me, it was like, oh no, when the Joker starts showing out, it's time to show out, it's time to go. And I'm watching the Joker run around this whole family and I'm like, ain't nobody gonna say nothing. So, you know, you this touched is on definitely... something. You touched on something. You mentioned the multiple marriages of your mom and your, your nana. Um, how has that affected how you you carry on within your marriage how has that affected your life and your marriage how do you value marriage now as a result of, of seeing multiple marriages with your matriarchs uh well this is my second marriage let's start there in my first when my first marriage ended i thought i was a failure because i felt like i was going to take on a line of you just like your mom you just like your grandma and i didn't want that because marriage is sacred and i was taught that it's sacred but you should not have to be struggling or fighting and fussing or understanding or compromising that's something that you don't have to do in a marriage and that is absolutely the furthest from the truth it is so incorrect and when I started to study psychology, I initially wanted to do relationship therapy. But I got off of that because I, you know, I, I swung into drug and rehab therapy first. And I love, I love that. But I did study enough to help myself to understand the first thing to make a marriage work is compromise and trust communication. And that has helped me a lot. My husband now was not a big communicator. He was kind of like, I said it and that's it. And I was just like, that ain't gonna fly. You gonna have to express yourself and explain to me why you want it like this so that I can understand you so that I can respect your decision. Because just respecting your word is, in, in all situations, is not, not gonna be enough for me. Because I'm gonna have a thousand questions and I'm gonna want you to answer those a thousand questions with a, with a good answer. I always tell people all the time, they ask me how come I speak Spanish natively? And I tell them because my husband didn't take the time to teach me with grammar. He taught me like, this is how it goes and that's that. And so I, I, I learned Spanish in 18 months, just like that. Um, and and I, I tell people all the time, communication and compromise is what you need to move about in this world. I, I'm married to Mexico now, just as well as I'm married to my husband. You know, I have dual citizenship, so I I don't really see myself as, as a different as as different in Mexico. You you have convivio conmigo mucho. You know that I am just as much African American, Native American, Mexican, Mexican Indian. I take on all my titles. I fight. I'm Afro Mexico, African Afro Mexicana. Um, 
I take on all my titles and I wear them well. And I try to be a part of all these communities. I try to wear my wife hat as well as possible. I try to wear my mom's hat as well as possible. My teacher hat, my psychologist hat. I try to wear all my hats that I have chosen to pick up because it's the thing. You have to choose. People don't, don't understand. When you choose to move out of your country, you need to choose to also be caring and kind and most importantly, understanding that you landed on them. They didn't land on you. So you cannot expect for them to roll out the red carpet for you and treat you as a privileged individual because they don't know these privileges. They don't. And, and I've seen it. One thing that, that bothers me in the new expat community, because like I said, when I moved to Mexico, it was not get on Facebook and, and converse. It was none of that, um, what's going on where you are type thing. One thing that I'm learning in these groups that frustrate me so bad is they want people to pick up and understand their personal issues. And they're not going to do it here. They're not going to do it here. They have their own issues that needs to be addressed. And because you're in their land, you should want to understand their issues and kind of leave your issues at the border. So basically I, i'm hearing several things i'm hearing you have to you know you have to have empathy sympathy you have to try to acculturate um and you also kind of have to uh like you said have this awareness that um two different cultures be respectful of the cultures but don't impose your experience don't be a bag lady as as erica badu said you know bag lady you know you gotta put your bags down when you come here um yes. That's what are you seeing? You're mentioning in the groups, uh, the, the expat the, or the immigrant groups, you know, I prefer the word immigrant. What are you seeing in the immigrant groups that you think it's a disconnect or new, newer immigrants are not trying to uh, form genuine, I guess, connections with Mexico, connections with Mexican people, uh, very, the Mexican, Mexican culture and all its variances? First of all, in the immigrant groups or expat, expat, expat groups, as you say, one of the things I noticed is a lot of people have zero inkling on Mexican culture. When I say zero inkling, they're like myself. They moved here thinking that Mexico was party in the bottle. They move here with the idea of I'm running from the United States because of racial issues or I'm retiring in Mexico and my money is going to go far in Mexico, but I'm not ready to go far mentally in Mexico. I read an article where a man said that he was giving back to the community by opening up a dog rescue. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> I mean, so. I think that one of the things that has to be done is you need to first learn the language. When you touch down in Mexico, I need you to learn the language. Like I said, I learned Spanish in 18 months and I did not have a teacher. This is going to shoot myself in the foot, but I'm not. Talk. Okay? Talk. I did not have a teacher and I did not have good internet. I watch novellas and I hate novellas. I hate novellas. I hate soap operas in English. I hate novellas. I watch the same novella three times a day. I talk to, and in Tijuana, you have a big Asian community and a big Haitian community. So, I mean, you have so many influences that you don't get Spanish that you need in better crews. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that too. But the idea here is that you learn enough to get by. But you don't get comfortable. You learn, you, you need to stay learning. And you need to keep your, your eyes on the fact that you left the United States or you left Canada for a reason. And when things get tough in Mexico, you need to remind yourself of the reason that you left where you left from so that you can continue to enjoy Mexico and, and enjoy the fruits of Mexico. Because it's not, it's not unicorns and candy corn and sugar pops here. There are some things going on that you will have to 
be confronted with here. But is it as bad? Is it is it worse here than it is where you're from? The reason that you left is it bigger than the reason that you're stressed out today in Mexico? For me, in my 11 years, I have never had that that whole oh I'm going back to the United States permanently because things are just ridiculous in Mexico. No, but once again, when I came here, the second go around in Better Cruz, I was ready. I didn't fuss about the milk situation. I didn't fuss about not being able to get a hold of grits. I didn't come down here looking for American products. Because when I went to Sonora, this is where I, I met Monty when I first told you about teaching. And she sat down and she told me, she said, one thing I want you to check at the door before you go into this classroom is I want you to check your Americanness. And I was like, what do you mean check my Americanness? She's like, yeah, check your Americanness. Remember, everybody does not know what you know. And I'm not talking about grammar. I'm not talking about vocabulary. And I was on the border with children who can cross every day who live in their best life. She was like, they don't understand the way you grew up. They definitely don't know what it is to be African American. So don't even try to compare them to. Just like, even because, you know, the Afro Mexican community, just like apples and oranges here, apples and oranges. So they need to be two separate streams. Did I understand her at that moment? No, ma'am. I sure did not. I sure did not. My attitude as an African American woman was like, you need to sit down, you open your books, you do your work, da 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 da. And I'm talking to a group of children whose parents don't sit with them and read. I'm talking to a group of children whose parents work 14, 16 hour days. So education for them is, I'm going to sit down and read, but I'm not going to understand it. I'm going to come to your class, and I'm going to ask you questions, and you're going to have to be my mom, my teacher, my tutor, my friend, and get me through this. So am I saying the same thing happened in the United States? Absolutely. Not as common, though, as here in Mexico. Not in my experience. Not in so, your experience. Okay. Not, in, not in my experience. You know, my mom worked her butt off, but my grandma stayed with me to study. And if she didn't, I had a nanny. So, you know, I always had somebody at the table with me to, to do my work. Versus here, I see kids, they, some of them don't even have a table. Let off somebody at the table with them. This is in Sonora so, as well as Veracruz. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. So, you know, it, it's, so, it's super important that when, when we're getting back to the expat or immigration coming, coming into Mexico, it's super important that we check our Americanness, that we check our privileges, that we that we come in being open and willing to understand where these people are coming from, especially if you're coming here to live. If you're coming here for vacation, you know, boss to the wall, do you. But when you come here to live, you need to understand that you're not going to be able to get everything you want. I mean, I suffer every day because of hair products. <laughs> I'm like, uh, Walmart has improved though. Mm -hmm. This what see your experience in Mexico is completely different. When I moved here, there was no Walmart. So so there was no Walmart. There was, there was no Walmart. There was no mall. Yeah. There was no mall. You had there a was, tough. You had a tough in Pueblo. Yeah. There was no if I wanted to go to Sam's because Sam's and Walmart were in another town that took an hour to get to. Mm. And they didn't have our hair products either mm. at all. And, and not just how I'm talking about, they didn't have the cleaning supplies that I was used to using. Okay. They didn't have anything that I was used to seeing. Let off Spanish being an issue for me. No, no, no. They didn't have anything. I'm talking about cranberry juice. They, there was so much that I was just like, they don't have Charmin. They just don't have nothing that i was so, used to so let me ask you this but what do you say well what about because there are a lot of immigrants um or expats who are living in areas that are very americanized okay they're living in the playa del carmen the cancun um the puerto vallarta and they don't and and they don't have to make these adult they, let me just you know the adjustments maybe don't need to be made because they're living in places that are just microwave ready microwave ready 
what do you say to that expat or immigrant? Look, you know, I got everything here. Uh, I operate in English. I don't really need to use Spanish as much because most of the people that are that are here that that I interact with speak English, and you know, I I can purchase what I want. I can get my American fix because this is Mini America in Playa del Carmen or Cancun or Puerto Vallarta. What do you say to those individuals that are migrating here, especially? in light of COVID, in light of the, you know, the recent, it's not recent, it's an ongoing thing with racial tensions in the United States and police officers killing us. But in light of, you know, the, the, the George Taylor, the Ahmed Arbery, the Breonna Taylor, in light of all of these things that are coming together with COVID, what do you say to these individuals that are migrating here? I mean, they're coming here now. I see them in the groups and uh, for various reasons, but this is, this is something that they mentioned, racism, COVID. Why, what do you tell them? They're, they're having a very Americanized existence here because of where they chose to live. Two things, two things. I would say first, you are not in Mexico mentally. And if you're not, not in Mexico here, mentally, I mentally. agree, absolutely. If you're not here mentally, you are dead weight. You are boosting an economy that you, you, you feel like you're boosting the Mexican economy, but a lot of people don't even realize in these areas, the owners of these establishments are not Mexican. So you're not even putting into the economy that you're sucking out of. So you're a succubus. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. I would say that they need to educate themselves because what's the purpose of moving to a country and wanting to see yourself still or your normal still? I travel to Playa del Carmen and Cancun every year because I just absolutely love the water. But I do not stay in these five-star hotels. I find that to be ridiculous. I normally went my apartment from a Mexican woman and her husband. This is giving back to their economy, okay? Her apartment has washer and dryer, stove. When I get there, she already has the food there that I need to cook. She has everything laid out. It's literally like I'm going from my home to another home. We travel. I like to drive because I like to go from Pueblo to Pueblo, meeting the people, eating the food, enjoying Mexico, shaking hands with the natives, when I see another American, it's like, hey, and I keep it moving because I don't really feel that I can learn anything from you at this present time because I'm on vacation and I'm trying to get to know my surroundings, the people who are here. I don't want to really talk about your experience in Mexico, especially if you live in Fire Carmel or Cancun because for me, you're missing out so much. It, now, if you live in these kind in, in these areas, but you're living with the Mayans and you speak Mayan, now we talk. Okay? If you live in Yucatan and you 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 estás con los Yucatecos conviviendo all the time. Okay? You, like you fishing with them. You're not in Blanco Merida walking around with Europeans, um, but you actually outside of Merida when night fall, because you understand that Blanco Merida means that you're not supposed to be there of color after dark. So you're saying Merida is a sundown town. We can talk. But if you in these places, because they need to go, you 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 talking to people, you 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 in the fight with people, you protesting with the people, you loving on the people, you you actually chopping up the um the the leaves that give you the red the red sauce for the fish. Now you experience in Mexico. But if you on Quinto Avenue, walking up and down Quinto Avenue, eating big prong shrimp. Uh, on vacation, talking about you paying seven hundred to a thousand dollars a month, you might as well go live on Fifth Avenue in New York. What are you doing? You're not even understanding what it is to be in Mexico. You you don't understand 
understand. You 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 don't understand what the Mexican life is because you are in a bubble. And excuse me, it could be my own ignorance. I don't want to knock anybody's um hustle or lifestyle. And I'm definitely I don't want anybody to feel like oh she's jealous because I'm not. Like I said, I go to these places every year. You know, Christmas, I'm out. But and I spend a good thirty days down here. But like I said, I'm native. Like. Literally, I put on my what, my moraches, <laughs> my sundress, my hat, and you know, my little backpack. I'm shopping with, with the locals. I'm in the fish market. I, you know, I'm all about artesanía. I'm all about giving back like that. I'm not in those big plazas buying American products. Because, like I said, if you go to these, these states, you know that the hotel you're staying in is probably an Arab's hotel or it's probably a Chinese person's hotel. You're going to spend all this money uh, at a beach resort and the money is not coming back into, into the Mexican community. It's actually being taken out, washed over and taken abroad somewhere else. So I would much rather stay at a B&B that is locally owned that you know the woman can support come over your local them. mexican businesses yeah exactly because let me tell you something the mexican people um, we as mexican people are being taxed all kind of ways we're being severely taxed right now severely taxed so as we're paying a lot of taxes it's important that we give to the so well, we give back to the people community. who are migrating here don't even know that part, that side of it you're talking about as a business owner here you know with the welsh english learning center so she has a whole different perspective and view as a, as a taxpayer as a business owner here uh, a business owner of a mexican uh, based business okay so she has to pay uh she's the taxes are exorbitant now with with our, our present president so people don't even, a lot of people don't even have that understanding of that side of Mexico in terms of the business and the taxes. There's just no awareness of that. There's no awareness let, of that. Because that's just not the existence that they, that they have. Exactly. I want to touch on something that I seen in one of the groups yesterday. They were complaining because they couldn't get non-essential food, or pardon, non-essential products after 7 p.m. Hmm. I was like, that's your fight? Why didn't you go to the market? Why are you in Chidoi? Yeah. That was my, you know, they were like, what do you think? I was like, I'm not even gonna say nothing. Cause yeah. we not gonna I see eye to eye here. You see what I'm saying? You complaining cause you can't buy hair dye and alcohol after 7 p.m. You complaining about trying to control the economics of COVID. People don't understand. Did you buy one hair dye? This money is not going into the community. This money is not touching who it needs to touch. So of course they need you to stop spending money in this way and go to your local market. The market closes at five o'clock, but it opens at 7 a.m. It's where you need to be. Fresh food, fresh herbs, fresh organic food to make sure that you have a healthy system. Not this Supporting stuff. locals, supporting locals. And yeah. It, it, it's supporting locals, but it's also giving you what you need physically. If mm -hmm. you eat healthy, you're not going to have so much issues. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but yeah, when we come down from the United States, when we come down from the United States, and I say we because, like I said, when, when we first started talking, this was so my mentality. This is why I was fussing about it. I was like, I need to get back to the North and give me some of this processed milk because <laughs> I need it. Um, when, once you realize, Eating healthy, you go to the market, support your locals, you're also helping yourself. You go to Chirawi, yo, the owner of Chirawi lives in Mexico City, part time. Part time. Where is he, the other where, is he where she from? from? Where are they from? Mexico. They're, they're from Mexico City, but they actually live in France half the year. Mm, interesting. Ah, uh, the name Chirawi is French. Yes. And, and and let me tell you this, if you if you have Netflix, you can watch their series and you can see how their children spend that money that we drop off in Shirawi. Okay. Oh, and <laughs> yeah. so, so you you can actually see how it's much better for me personally, I'm just like, you know what? I appreciate the gourmet section of Shirawi. I appreciate it's, it's the gourmet expensive. section. 
It's expensive. Yeah, I, that's where I'm going. And and when I go to these garment sections of Chiawi in these garment sections of Walmart, ooh, I'm like, is these Apple Jacks really worth it? And I do it for my son because I'm like, I want you to have this experience with me. Like when I was growing up, I want you to get these, you know, this Anchamama syrup and this, these hot cakes. I, I want to have this with you, but it's an everyday thing. No, because I know that I'm not helping my community. Do I go to the market? Yes. Do I eat fresh fish? Yes. Because I know that this person is fishing at four o'clock. For example, if you go to the markets here, you know that the fishermen go to Alvarado at two, three o'clock in the morning and they bring the fish from Alvarado back to our pueblo and they're here seven o'clock i need to support that because that's that's a hustle it sure that's is a hustle. they it drive sure three is. hours they fish and then they come back here and they serve us and then they go to bed at seven o'clock at night to get up again and go the next day absolutely you know what i'm saying so i need to support that and and, and to, you know to, to answer the, the question and, and close out of, about access moving here and moving to the whitewashed areas <clears throat> excuse me think about the name of the city you move into what does it mean cancun is snakes mm, no idea. yeah it's it, cancun is mayan and it's serpentics snakes when you go to cancun do you even see a snake probably not no no Cancun is known exactly. Cancun is known for its reptiles, jaguars. Look at the Mayan people. Look at the Mayan pictures. Their imagery was so pretty and so in detail. And then you go and you don't see none of that unless you go to a pyramid. Unless you go to where the Mayans are, you don't see absolutely none of it. So there's a to lot of erasure because of commercialization. Exactly. Or exactly. over commercialization. Yeah. Yes. When you hear better Cruz, people don't realize we have so many um, ruins here in Better Cruz. Like they just found a new one uh, in downtown of our pueblo. They had no idea. Oh, I didn't know it's that. New. They, their people were digging in their backyard and came across a whole new pyramid. You know, we're the, the whole place, the whole place was developed before colonization. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We're, we're on Omeka territory. So, of course, Omeka territory, yes. We, we, we have to, to be acknowledging to that. When you go to Tahin, Cordoba, Cordoba has new ruins every day. Yes. Okay? Yes. When, 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 when you go out and you see, for example, uh, I say Pueblo, but yeah, it's Orizaba. When you see, Orizaba, when you hear Orizaba, Cordoba, Fortin, think about the name and try to find the roots of that name. When you think about the city you move into, don't look for people who are like you because what are you going to learn? You can stay in your neighborhood. You can stay in your neighborhood and be around people who like you. Think about the roots. Think about what you can learn. Think about what's different and be open to it. They put crickets on the table to eat. Try them. Chiquitanas, try them. You know, I don't eat pork. I don't eat beef. <laughs> and I just had a real detrimental experience trying new foods. Am I glad that I did? Because I experienced a salsa that was divine. And I was like, can we put this on chicken? Can we put this on fish? And this is the experience that I would love for everybody to understand when they come to Mexico. Don't make faces because here in Mexico, and I, I'm pretty sure it's just like this in, in any other country. Because even in the United States, when you know, when you go to my grandma's house, if there's no food on the table, my grandma is sick. So, <laughs> I mean, I think this is just how we are, our culture. Um, when, when they offer you something as far as food, wine, tequila, their life, their homes, be open to it. Don't go in looking for what you can compare your life to back home as. Because that's a big issue. When you, when you come here, you need to kind of forget about where you're from and think about where you're going. Why'd you make this decision to come? 
and be open to trying. Am I saying let people abuse you? No, because that's another, that's a, that's a whole other situation. You know, people here are very cunning, very um, stucho, very abusivo. So you also need to watch out for that because they do like the American aspect. They do look for that and they roll out a false red carpet when they know that you're American. So you do have to be very um, eyes open to make sure that you're building healthy relationships and not relationships that are one-sided. Um, so, you know, like I said, Mexico has been a very big learning experience for me. It has made me develop me, as a woman. I want to I want to speak to that. Um, a friend of mine, she had spent time in Denmark. She's a Mexican woman. She had spent time in Denmark and she also lived in the United States. And she said when she was in Denmark, the Mexican, uh, the Danish people were cold, distant, not too sociable. Pero when you made friends with them, they were, they were your sincere friends for life. They were true blue, they were your friends. Once you got past the frigidness, the coldness, they were sincere and, you know, in their, their genuine um, friendship with you. She said, as again, we're, this is a generalization and we're stereotyping, not every Mexican, these, these are generalizations. Um, she said, with, with Mexican people, they can be very kind and nice, but that it wasn't sincere. So I always, you know, I always keep that in mind. And as you say, you know, I'm imposing myself here. I always tell myself, Roxana, you have to adjust. You mean, it may not understand it, you know, it might annoy you, it may, it may not make sense to you, but you have to always adjust because this is not your culture. This is not where you grew up, you don't have a point of reference. So I say that to say, being here, being an immigrant, being a, a single mom, being a black woman, um, I think one of the things you learn is to become, and I've had this conversation several times on here, self-reliant in a way. Yeah. You better learn to love yourself and enjoy your company. Because you, you're going you to be sad. You know, you'll, you'll be a sad person if you don't really learn to, you know, not everyone is going to be your sincere friend. Um, and people will just want to have entanglements, entanglements. People would live yeah. with you because you have your blue passport, because you're from the United States. It may not have anything to do with you as an individual. And that's, that's something that you always have to navigate and, and, and be wary of and be aware of. Thanks. I will say this, they, they, being here will be an ego boost because they will let you know how pretty your skin is, how curly your hair is, how they love you, how they want to adore you, how they put you on this pedestal. But once they figure out that you're not going to allow them to manipulate you in certain ways when you're not available for them um, 24 hours a day, um when you can't teach their children english for free when you can't um come to every party because you're not a show dog uh once they figure out these things they will dwindle off i always say when 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 the newness wears off and you're looked at as igual this is when stuff gets real because you have to now check yourself and be like did I just invest six to nine months with you as trying to build a friendship? And because I said no once, things have changed. Because this is something else, people here are extremely sensitive. They are way more sensitive than what we are. I would like agree. We, 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 are, we are Teflon tough. You know, we have had to be Teflon tough. This is something that, this is the bag that we carry that is very hard for us to let go. We are very, very hard to be transparent. We are, we are hard individuals to be like, here I am and love me like this. And then even when I'm wrong, still love me. And the people here are super sensitive. I'm talking about- I would agree. Even if you don't, I have had people- People I've interacted with are, are sensitive. People I've interacted with, yes. I have friends, you know, I've been here 11 years. I've had friends that are like, oh, you didn't say good morning to me this morning on what's up. And I'm like, for real? You know, I work. You know? <laughs> like, like, you'll be all right. You'll be yeah. all right. What, 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 like, really? 
Tell me something important. <laughs> yes, or, or if you didn't get a chance to go to the party on Saturday because you're exhausted, they're like, hey, hey, I invited you and you didn't come. Are you mad at me? I'm like, no, I'm tired. My son's five. Your son is 50. It's different. So um, you have to be, you have, this is what I'm telling you, or, or I'm telling most of the, the new people coming in, this is a lot. It's a learning experience. It's every day you got to learn the culture. You got to learn the people. You got to learn the food. You got to learn the language. You got to learn to breathe. You got to learn the law. You just got to learn. And you have to continue to learn. Yeah, I think back home, we kind of get in a routine. So we become robots to that routine. We no longer learn. We're just like, okay, so I got to work. I got to do that. And in Mexico, as a, eh, there's no robots. There's no robot. If you're a robot in Mexico, if you're doing the same things that you were doing back home, I think you need to probably move again. You need to move again. You need to, to go somewhere else that, that is better for you because you've moved into another comfort zone. If you, I always tell people this, and I, I'm not sure if this is going to resonate with you. If you move into a house, that you do not have to start the boiler to take a hot shower, you might as well stay home. Because Mexico, with Mexicans, start the boiler to take a shower. Yeah. I don't know a Mexican who has not lost an eyebrow trying to start the boiler. Am I scared of the boiler? Yes, ma'am. Did I get a calentar solar? on top of my house so I, so I don't have to move with the boiler. Yes, I did. I'm a witness. When, One of the reasons why I moved where I live. I I first live where I live now. Here, mm -hmm. when I, he is, oh, it was a fight with this boiler. I was like, oh my God, the water is cold. And my husband was like, he didn't turn the boiler. I was like, what is turning the boiler on? Because back home we have boilers, but they on all the time. That's right. You know, he was like, now you gotta turn the boiler on. If not, we're just gonna be wasting gas. I was like, wasting gas? We got to pay gas? I was like, this is craziness, you know? And, and people are like, oh, that's not my struggle. I'm gonna buy this, or I'm gonna rent this really expensive apartment, and I'm just gonna have the Mexico experience. No, you're not having the Mexican experience if you have never gotten a shower and be like, darn, we don't have no gas. Cierto. Cierto. You have to turn on that shower and that cold water hits your back. And you're like, oh. I've taken many a cold shower. Off. I've taken many. And the winter okay, cold. The, and you were just. Yes. That's, yes. I've, in this, the winter. This to, me, this to me is Mexico. Now you have something to sit down and talk to a Mexican about. And that's mm -hmm. the idea. That you can hold a conversation with them and we can see eye to eye. You see what I'm saying? Because I hate when I sit down and they're like, oh, no comes chile. And they see, sí, come on. No. Uh, no sabía eso, porque en tu país, y digo, mira, yo llevo 11 años aquí. Mi exactly. país es tu país. Yeah, yo, I understand your struggle. We have the same struggle. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Now we understand each other. Now we can talk about everyday life. We can talk about politics. We can talk about education together. We can talk about vacationing because if you're not talking to Mexicans about where to go, where they go, because I also know that going to Playa de Carmen, these, these nice places, the Mexicans there are going to send you somewhere to spend a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. They're not going to send you to no private beach or should I say underdeveloped beach that's beautiful. They're not going to send you there. They're not going to send you where they go. They're going to send you where your people at. If you're not in the know. So this is why you gotta learn the language. So you can tell exactly yeah. that's why you gotta learn the language. You talk, yo no quiero ir, yo no quiero ir a donde están más americanos. Yo quiero ir a donde están ustedes. Yeah, yo quiero comer con tu abuela. Yo quiero comer con tu abuela. Yo no quiero comer con mi gente. Sí. That's that's so, my Mexican experience. So let me ask you because that's a bit of othering. You know, they're looking at you as oh well, you know, and we're always going to be othered because we're black and that's that's a whole other thing. We're American. How do you always deal with othering? You said you know I've been here eleven years. Like you know I, I'm aware of the pica, you know, a spicy food. 
and you know we've been here three years and it's like are, do you are you on vacation uh the other day amaris and i were walking and this man dragged by us and he was like tourists turistas, turistas. and i'm like no we're not she's most so i says we've been here three years so how do you uh always navigate this othering like, because it's like you always have to validate look i live here i live here i've been here x amount of years i'm not a tourist mm -hmm. I only experience, and this is craziness. I don't know if it's because I've been here so long, people are used to seeing me, um, or for 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 the school. I don't experience that unless wow. I do. go to. Yeah, I know you do. I know. Unless I go to a museum, or unless I go to a tourist area here, this is when they they treat me or they say things like, "Oh, bienvenido." How long have you been here? How long are you staying? We're staying. But when I'm out and about, they don't. But I can also tell you this. I speak Spanish like 100% of the time. So I think they catch it in my voice because a lot of people have asked me, um, what part of Latin America am I from? And I have to let them know that I'm American because they don't catch it. They don't catch it. They always tell me all the time that my Spanish is, is, is mas local or colloquial. Than, than American Spanish, and I think that's a, that's an issue. They, they a lot of people think I'm Brazilian or Cuban, and I'm like, nope, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. So, uh, and I think that might be an issue when when I come right right off the bat. I'm like, hola, cómo estás? ¿Qué onda? Este, mira, yo quiero esto, esto, esto. Entonces, I think that makes a big difference. And I, absolutely and I, and does. I, absolutely I, does. I, I think I think they understand, and once they realize that you speak their language, I'm talking about academic language, academic Spanish or food Spanish. Once they realize that you can relate to them on on whatever like whatever platform they're coming at you with, they cut that whole take advantage of the American card thing out. Well, when you speak someone's language, that's it. That's identity. Yeah. It's culture. I I I think that's that's a major um. A major thing for me because I really don't get the whole how long you've been here, where you staying, welcome. I get what's up. It's nice to see you again, type of treatment. So I and you know but, my Spanish is so low. Uh, uh, you're right. That makes a difference. That's that's the key. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. I I, I truly really believe so because even when we go on vacation or we travel for day day vacation, it's the same thing. I never I've never gotten the or I shouldn't say never. I haven't gotten in the last, I want to say eight, nine years, the whole, the donde eres. We still get it. I know. I, I, I don't get that. But let me tell you, when I did first move here, I hated taking a taxi, girl. I hated it because they'd be like, oh, ya sé donde vives tú. And I was like, ooh, why? How do you know where I live? Ah, es que tú estás nueva. And That's I'm really like, real. Yeah, and they were like, oh, pero tú es de Cuba, verdad? And I'm like, nah. Cuba, I'm, yeah. And I hit them with this. No, nah, I'm from TJ. And only locals understand that TJ is Tijuana. Because Americans come down talking about Tijuana and Tijuana. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, nah. No. And so it was easier for me to, to close that, like you would say, close that door on los chismos. I I was able to tell them, hey, and 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 it was it was easier for them to understand that she's been here a while. She she like us. And okay. and when you start to talk to them about things that affect them locally, like I you know, I love politics. I absolutely love politics. So I'll hit them real quick with oh que piensa de esto, esto, esto? Yeah, they understand that I understand their strife too, that we're in it together. And so yeah, I don't get that that otherness, and I don't get too many people trying to abuse me as an American either, because I used to get that a lot on the border, and that's something that people need to understand on both borders, southern and north, northern and southern. They try to take advantage of you when you don't know the language, you don't know the money situation. Tú no puedes dependerte en cualquier idioma, because even in English, you can say, "Oh, that's expensive," and they they start talking to each other. It's kind of like when back home when you go to get your nails done. And the Vietnamese is da, 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 and you can't really understand what's going on. 
if you just sitting there looking crazy, it's just like that. You know, I, I remember well, language is culture. Language is culture. Exactly. And I can I can remember in Tijuana where um I went to buy a wicker laundry basket and they charged me eight hundred pesos. And I was like, okay, because for me with my American ness, I'm like, girl, eight hundred pesos, do 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 no pasta nada because to me I was like, Oh, it's 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 way cheaper than in the States. When I got home, my husband was like, You paid how much? And he turned me right back around and we went right to the store. And he must have cursed out on because they he, they were Asians who overcharged him, first of all. Wow. And my my husband was like, Y'all not even from here. Y'all just speak the language yourself. How dare you? And I told my husband, I was like, No, don't fight for me. Because it's my ignorance, my stupidity that didn't prepare me for this. So it's a let it's an L, it's a loss. And I'm gonna keep losing until I learn the language and I learn how to adjust and from there that was it i was like no nah, i got to learn this language because i'm not gonna keep losing and that's what that's that's what i learned to do you know i told you i 72 hours i made the decision to move down here and i had to i had to fight to stand up and now i can stand you know now i can go to a business i'm very proud of myself and you know i'm working on my doctorate i'm very proud of myself because i go to school in 100 percent yeah a doctorate level, PhD level. Okay. I mean, it's a hundred percent. I'm looking for the primer in Spanish. <laughs> nobody, nobody, when I say no, nobody speaks English to me. Uh, and your, school, like, your online learning, your university? Nobody. Nobody. percent Spanish. Academic. Uh, academic. Academic. Spanish. And it's been a struggle. Because, like I said, I learned Spanish watching TV, listening to music, hanging out with my husband and his friends and family. And honestly, people don't speak academic Spanish in a home environment. Sure. sure. And um, as my mother, with my mother-in-law would say, "Yo soy una mujer este, grosera de vocabulario." <laughs> she said, "You have rude, rude for a woman." Uh, I'll tell you this now: it's reckless in English and in Spanish. So. Um, so I've had to learn to curb it. I've had to learn what a woman should talk like in Spanish because this mouth was built by a man. I'm telling you, my father-in-law gave me most of my vocabulary. So, so you, could, you're learning to quote a uh, code switch now. Yes. So let you know, me ask you this. You're learning to code switch in Spanish. We do it in English. Yeah. You're, learning, you're, you're doing it in Spanish. Um, how important is that in terms of your your professional life as a as a business owner uh your academic life what have you noticed with the code switching because i know one word that you would always say a poco and um i love that word i just love the way it sounds and it's like saying oh for real or like you know it's like what for real a poco like oh really really and then i learned that the other word for it is en serio so mm -hmm. you know that's my own little sad you know i know there's other codes but that's that's a, that's like the equivalent that's the more formal mm -hmm. so what have you observed now that you you're you're aware that now that you code switch now that your spanish is at a level where you have your different levels your intimate home informal spanish and your more formal professional academic spanish i think i am being taken much more serious in a professional world no i think i know because when i come to the table as an american as an african-american woman they don't expect it when you hear the name of my school anybody who knows anything about languages you know that welsh is a language itself so when you hear it you imagize or your imagery is a white woman Okay. So when you get this, and then they realize that it's my husband's last name and he's Mexican, it's just like, what? What is going on? So, um, and then they realize that I speak Spanish. I don't need a translator. I get my point across academically, professionally. It takes them back. And it makes me stand out completely different from my competition because when i speak for example when when i present my service to um 
in exchange programs, for example. It makes the conversation take on an intimate level because Mexicans like like to hug. They like intimacy. Cariñoso. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's I'm able to be intimate in that way with them. I'm able to be like, oye, que pasó? No recibió tu correo. But I'm also to say, hey, how are you? I have not received your email. I'm also able to say to them, hola, como estas? Este, como te fue tu día? Todo bien, no has recibido tu correo. More and formal. that mm -hmm. that is so important because once you get on the level where you can you can actually build a personal relationship with the person you're talking to, like you are one with them, yeah, the world is yours to conquer here. They stop treating you as the other, and they're like, oh yeah. Not all, oh, yo necesito hablarle con ella, ella no me entiende, me va a confundir. No, me hablas. One thing I'm, I'm working on, like I said, with, this, with, my, with my doctorate is writing because, um, and I think this happens in English too, I'm pretty sure you've seen this, and everybody is. Writing in whatever language I think right now is super lackadaisical. It's super lazy right now, super lazy. And Writing in Spanish with acentos is something that even Spanish people have stopped to do. And I'm doing it. And I've had quite a people tell me, oh my God, your writing is good. Because it's know? the proper way. It's the correct, because the, original way to write the language with accentos. Like, and I, I'm getting that a lot. And I'm like, I asked my husband, oh yeah, why are, they, why are they happy about my writing? I think it's horrible because you know, I'm still at that moment where some things I'm translating to make sure that it makes sense. And he's like, no, because you're using accentos, you're not confusing the H and the Y, you know, you're using the letters correctly. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I see my students do it too. I'm like, hey, you're writing really lazy. So I need you to stop that and start writing professionally because we don't want these bad habits. But then again, I've also seen other people who teach language accept it. I watched a whole YouTube video about the accepting of this bad English and this bad Spanish because it's the new generation, the new eras. And I could just hear my grandmother telling me, uh uh, we're not going to accept this, you know. But once again, it's another bag that I've came here with. My struggles are different. You know, back home, you have to be educated to be taken seriously. And education is not just, you know, verbal, it's how you write, it's how you sit, it's your poise, it's everything. And this is something that I'm proud of that I've transferred over into Spanish. Also, I, I like this with it. And, and I, I recommend that everybody, if you come here, you want to start a business, that um, you do it. You do it for yourself. Don't look for somebody who is here to go into business with you. You can do it by yourself. But you got to learn the culture. You got to learn Spanish. You got to stand up on your own two feet. So that way they take you serious because my husband his experience with with business is completely different from mine i get the door open and the carpet rolled out right now. and my husband gets the door closed why is that <laughs> why uh malinchistas jealousy no malinchistas is uh not celoso my... jealousy is celoso what is malinchista Bad intentions? Um, no, Malinchista is, we, we would describe Malinchista as the crab in the bucket. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, that's a whole other subject. Malinchista. A lot of Mexicans don't feel like Mexicans can teach them anything. Hmm. That's, and that's, that's just, a, uh, that's, just uh, that's an internal um, insecurity, and fury, that's an internal issue. Yeah, yeah, they've been taught this that you yeah, know because black people have that same issue as well. So yeah, crab in the bucket. Yeah, crab, crab in, in the bucket. bucket. Malinchistas, so, yeah. Malinchistas, and and this is a fight that we have all the time. When I tell people that my husband's last name is Welsh, not mine, because they're like, "Oh, Miss Welsh," and I'm like, "No, nah, that's not my last name. That's his last name." And it's his mother's name, so even though we're married, I would take on his father's name, which would be Hernandez. So Welsh. As well, and they're like, "Oh, really? Where is he from?" I'm like, "Veracruz." They're like, "But that's Mexico." I'm like, "Yeah, this is where you know 
that you can come down here thinking a certain way because there was a lot of boat stopping in Veracruz and yes, not ma'am. just slave yes, boats. So yes, <laughs> there was a lot of boat stopping in Veracruz. Yep. So you cannot, yep. you can't come Her down here. Her husband's also Cuban. Stop. His bisabuela is Cuban. So exactly. he's Cuban and Cuban Irish and Irish. indigenous. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So there is no, th- th- I, I wish and I hope and I pray that people stop generalizing Mexico and Mexicans. I hate to see this image and I'm going to describe to you. It's this little man with a sombrero and mm-hmm. he's kneeled down and a donkey girl that thing sets fire to my soul. It sets fire to my soul. I have, I've been in Mexico 11 years. I think I've seen two donkeys. Okay, I think I've seen two, one in Tijuana and one in a pueblo here in Veracruz. People don't realize how the vastness, I, you know, and I'll say this all the time, you know, Mexico is so large that Europe can fit into Mexico maybe once or twice. It's a huge country. And this is prior to when Santana sold it, where he had taught me. He's from Veracruz and he sold Arizona and New Mexico and, and Nevada and California and Texas. Can you imagine how huge Mexico was prior to that time, prior to it being chopped? So right at this point, the way Mexico is, Europe can fit here twice, twice over, just to give you an idea of the vastness. And there's not just one Mexico. Like she just described to you the situation in Tijuana or TJ, as we call it locally, um, living in Sonora, and then now in Veracruz, and then spending time in the south of Mexico, Quintana Roo, in the Yucatan, or the Caribbean. So there's just so much diversity here. You know, it's not just spring break where you could come and get wasted. Um, it's more than than a vacation spot, you know, and it's more than a place where people, that, you know, the cartel. It's so much more than that. It's a, it's variance. It's variance. I, I tell people this all the time. Mexico is thirty two okay. states. It's thirty two states and one district. Um, yeah. Each state is uniquely. Yeah. Uh, each state is uniquely different. Mm-hmm. Each state, I, I mean, I've seen people get shocked when I tell them it's cold and there's snow. They're like, where are you in Mexico? Did you have snow and it's cold? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, let me show you. We have snow. We have a need for big, heavy coats. Um, and then also- It's I have very traumatizing. It's still traumatizing. <laughs> me. Yeah, I told we, you the day I saw Ivan in that, in the coat, I was like, huh? Why is he wearing this coat? Yes. What is going on here? It, you know, because you have an idea in your mind, Mexico is all warm. No, no. no. We're in the mountains. I can, well, Pico is, is, you can't see Pico now, but there's snow in July on Pico de Orizaba, the largest yeah. volcanic mountain in Mexico, which is in our view. Rakia can see it where she lives. I can see it where I live. It's gorgeous. And it's a pleasure, yeah. it's a privilege to see it every day. And there's always snow on that mountain with a back and i'm seeing palm trees you know and that that's the beauty of Mexico. And if you keep your eyes on the prize here you realize that you have to be evolving and adapting because your environment is evolving and adapting every day there is no same thing in mexico every day like literally you can drive 30 minutes and be hot as fire we go into cordova it's humid, it's hot, it's ridiculous. And then you drive back in order to tell me, like, where's my coat on? Where's my boots? Where's the umbrella? Very you know, much so. You drive down to Puebla and it's freezing. Free, I mean, you have now forgotten how cold Orizaba is because now Puebla is dry and freezing mm-hmm. cold. You keep driving to Tabasco and Ooh, now you're so hot. You're so hot, you just don't know what to do with yourself. Absolutely. I mean, you can go to Toluca, and it's like you're in the middle of New York in the wintertime. It's snow everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just Mexico is beautiful. Varied. Very and varied. If, mm-hmm. if you come to Mexico with the idea of fly to Carmen Cancun, Yucatan, Puerto Vallarta. It's so much more than that. You are missing out. Oh, it's so much more than that. Yeah. <laughs> you are missing out. And I'm talking about, I have traveled all 32 states in the district several times. I absolutely love to travel. Um, and, and I absolutely love to travel Mexico. I have been to every state, and I swear to you, I have not finished exploring one state in its entirety. Yeah. 
there's, there's, so there's, much there's too much to see. see. There's so much to see. We and love so Jalisco. We love Hidalgo. Chiapas was beautiful. These are the places that we've been to. And that's just a scratch. That's just a, a little pin drop in the places to explore here. And these are, these are you know, we intentionally go to places that are not very tourist heavy. I'm trying to think, what is the most... Yeah, I, I haven't been to the, the usual spots. Like, I haven't been to the Cabo, the Puerto Vallarta, uh, the Playa del Carmen, not, the Cancun. I haven't been to those areas. You know, it, I would, I would, I would, I'm not opposed to going there, but they're not mm -hmm. high on my list of must-sees. I, I love, you know, Hidalgo. Hi, Vaughn. Hi, hi, Gio. How's your day? Hi, Gigi. You know, so I, I enjoyed... Um, that's her baby boy. I enjoyed... Uh, visiting friends in Hidalgo. I enjoyed visiting friends in um, Jalisco and Veracruz is beautiful. It's a beautiful state. It's, it's gorgeous. I, I can't stress that enough, how, how beautiful the, the place is. You know, 360 mountain views, gorgeous. Um, and and so where we live is beautiful and I'm, I'm very spoiled. Like when I go to the States and I don't see a mountain, I'm like, why is the place so flat, you know? Um, or and the we're, fresh we're very lucky. We're very lucky to live here. We're very privileged to live here. You know, sometimes that's I, it's surreal. Like, like oh, I'm in Mexico. I live in Mexico. Let me pinch myself. And not and, and and not just Mexico. I'm I'm in a culture that has been warm and inviting to me because you've been to mm -hmm. Europe and you've had friends who've been to Europe. Mm -hmm. When you travel to other countries, Europe based or bound, I didn't feel accepted. I didn't feel like they were no, definitely got we have much love here. Yes. I didn't feel like they were like, You're beautiful. I didn't feel like they were like, Oh, sit down, tell me about yourself. They were caught up in the hustle and bustle of themselves. And I'm talking about I'm like Croatia for me is small, but the experience didn't feel small. It didn't feel small for me at all. It felt very um, touristy all the time. Like I, I could not settle in. And here in Mexico from day one, it was easier to settle in here than any other country I've been to. Oh, I, I would agree. I would agree living, living in Europe. I would agree that um, we are received with open arms with people here in this Pueblo, with my friends, uh, you know, in Hidalgo, with my friends in Jalisco, um, just open arms. People are extremely uh, kind. You know, we've uh, just spoiled. I just feel like we're spoiled. We've gotten things. People just want to give us things. People want to touch us, literally take pictures with us. Um, it's love. I mean, people have been just very affectionate. And, you know, Mexicans are very cariñoso. so they're very affectionate. And we've experienced this. We, we, as in me and my daughter, I would definitely agree with you there. The, yeah. The, the, the hand, yeah, you're, you're, you're so on point, and your, your experience is more enriched because you're, you make an honest attempt to understand where you're at. You're trying to un, genuinely understand where you're at and not see it through your lens, mm -hmm. because you know, and and that's a that's a long, you know, that's a learning curve. That's a process. To, to see things where you add and take it for what, what it is and to learn. I, think I have I a lot of notions of the Afro-Mexican community. I'm going to, but no, I have to adjust and learn. No, I, and see, when I came to Mexico, the Afro-Mexican community was still very much a hush-hush thing. You know, they just hit the census in 2015. So it was a very hush-hush thing. So I wasn't affected by that. Like, I see a lot of expats digging into this and i'm just like oh my god y'all just don't understand but um afro-mexican communities are very standoffish because they have learned to protect themselves in that manner and the ones that i have come in contact with only been in contact with two that's here in yanga and in costa chica and they don't have our struggle at all, at all, at all. We are being murdered by the police. Yes, we murder ourselves, yes. But imagine not being able to say anything about your ancestors because you speak Spanish, so you're looked at as the same, just poor. 
because that's their struggle. They can't embellish or acknowledge or accept who they are 100% because for their community or their culture or their government, eh, some of you are less because you speak Spanish. Versus indigenous, yeah, now we have a difference because they have a dialect. They either speak Mayan or um, I forget, not Nahuatl, or there's a hundred and some odd dialects here in Mexico, but the two that I'm familiar with is Mayan and Nahuatl. Imagine that your ancestors were disregarded to the point that their language was erased, like us. So you were forced to speak Spanish and you can't defend yourself in any other language so you can't ask for anything to be different for you in any other language because they erased that from you. And being that they erased it from you, now you are looked at as equally just darker. Yes, they have these titles, mestizo, which you are, but they don't base that, they didn't base the color of your skin as your difference. Here in Mexico, the difference was your language. This is why they don't have so many resources. They govern themselves mainly. And a lot of and people- resources are not allocated to them. Exactly, because they, they technically have the same resources as everybody else in Mexico. But it's not the case. But it's not the case. No. And it's very, a lot of Afro-Mexicans when they come out of I call them reservations because, you know, I'm Native American. So when I look at Afro-Mexican community, it puts me back reservation territory for my family life. This is your land. This is where you should feel safe. If you come out of this land, you better be prepared to fight. And then not just physically, but emotionally and verbally. And this happens. They come off of their territory. And a lot of times they have to go to jail because they do not have credentials. They don't have uh, passports. So in, in instances, they're stateless, even though they're yeah. born and bred Mexican, multi generational, and you yeah. don't have you don't have official credential, uh, which is your your I, national identification card. They don't have. Uh, I'm telling you because they just were accepted in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, or around about that time. They just were added to the census, so they were just included. They were, I, I, included is a bad way to say it. They were just accepted for their differences in 2015. That's what it because was. Because Mexico, you're Mexican. You're, you're Mexican. There's no, there's, there's no, no, you're either Mexican or indigenous. Yes. What makes indigenous different? They have their dialect. Mm -hmm. But if you speak Spanish, you're Mexican. So you're Mexican. go to school, live your life. But when you have this fear of leaving your reservation, who's going to go to school? Who is going to reach out for a new life or a different life? And nobody's actually reaching back to pull you forward, you know? So this is something that, that you know, I spoke to you about. It bothers me to see immigrants come here, especially us as African-Americans, looking to impose our culture on them. Because, I, you know, a lot of people are like, did you know that the first black president was Guerrero? And I'm like, yeah. But did he know? Mm. And that is the question. Did he know? Did, did he, he know? know? Because I don't think he would have known. I don't think he would. Probably not. I don't think he yeah, would. Highly unlikely when you look at the history of Mexico. Yeah, yeah. I don't think this he is would not a Colombia. It's not a Cuba. <laughs> the the whole blacks diaspora, African diaspora, no. it's coming about. It's rising up. There are more and more visibility and everything, but it's not as I guess developed or recognized as a Cuba or a um, a Colombia. You know that have very There's strong black, a black presence. And there are black no. people from Canada all the way down to Argentina. You know, yeah, in the they, and they're proud to have. African blood, but I don't think they're proud of African blood like we are as far as being educated. They look at their shapes and they're like, oh, because soy africana. Because I've had plenty of women tell me, 
Ay, yo tengo pompis como tú, porque yo soy africana como tú. And I'm like, yeah, wait. I don't really have a butt. <laughs> like, yeah, I can show you some folks that'll make you be like, oh my God. So you have to be proud differently. They don't look at their African roots as, oh, Rosa Parks or Booker T. It's Washington. a different, it's a different they, experience. Different they don't history. Even under, different yeah, histories. Yeah. Different history. They don't understand how important their ancestors were to history either. We, we study it. I know people who don't even realize that Yanga was a prince and they from Yanga. Yeah. They knew Yanga as a slave who freed slaves. Yeah, but they don't know the, the history prior. Exactly. They, they're not into that studying of important Afro Mexicans or Africans for that and, matter. And, and it could be a crippling narrative. Yeah. Exactly. And they and, and for me personally, I don't teach it. Why? I, why? Because I'm here to learn your aspect. In order for me to teach you African American history, I teach African American history in my classes. But yeah. when I go to an Afro Mexican community, I shut everything down that I know and I listen. I don't make comparisons. I don't draw conclusions until I'm in the car, on home, on my way home, taking notes. Because I believe in order for me to learn, I must be quiet. And I need to build a relationship with that person to see how they understand history to make sure I don't offend them with my knowledge. Is it important for me not to offend people with my knowledge? Yes. Does it make me stupid? No because I'm still absorbing what they have to say. And I've learned in this moment many of times that they have no earthly idea of education the way I do. Something simple that has nothing to do with color. If you ask a group of people how many continents there are that live here in Mexico, they're gonna tell you five. That's what is taught here. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I had this battle, this is where I learned. Cállate, te ves más bonita calladito. Yes? You cannot reteach a whole country. Okay? It's much better to listen to how they were learned or how they were taught. Take what you need from it and keep it moving. And keep it moving. If you can reach one person that you build a bond with, a sense of security, that you can converse with, volley, you can have a volleyball type of conversation, go for it. But a lot of people don't have time because they're trying to eat. You see what I'm saying? You know, that's something else with education here. A lot of people need to eat to study. You see what I'm saying? So they don't have we're, in, we're in a developing country, yeah. We're in a developing yeah. country, yeah. If they don't have time to sit down with me and politic in that way, they got to get food on the table. It's a privilege. It's a luxury to be able to do that. Exactly. So I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to go into these areas, learn what I need to learn, see our same differences, acknowledge our differences, grow with our differences, and move on. I don't need on. them. Yeah, I don't need them. See, and that's something that's something that I wish the expat community or immigration community would understand. They're not looking to be like us, so why we need to look to be like them? Why we just can't be individuals? learning to live amongst each other hmm. i don't need to go to your house and see what i can find to make me feel comfortable i don't need to go to your house and see what i can find to make me comfortable that's exactly. a word that's like, that's how i feel i go in somebody's house and i just need to be comfortable where i am that's a word i'm not going through your cupboards i'm not going in your kitchen trying to figure out do we eat alike do we dress alike do we have the same hair products? I'm good. You know, I, I'm okay if my respecting differences. Are... Yes. And your I'm story okay. is not my story, and that's okay. I'm okay that my shea butter doesn't work for you. Just like you're okay that that guy doesn't work for me. And that's that. That's that. That's, that's, that. that's the that's, that's that. the best way 
that I have learned to get along here in Mexico my 11 years. I'm not planning on going back to the United States um, to live. I, I, the last time I went to the United States, I took my son to Disney. And I'll never forget that in Florida, I started crying in the airport. <laughs> I was crying. I felt so out of my comfort zone. I felt so far away from home. I didn't know what to do with myself. And I will tell you this. I spoke Spanish and the Cuban community helped me find my plane, find lunch, move my bags. My husband wasn't with me. The whole the whole demeanor of everything changed. That that <laughs> happened to me too in Miami. I had to flip into Spanish and it was a totally different thing with the service I received in the restaurant. Speaking of Spanish, speaking of Spanish, the Wells English Learning Center, as she mentioned to you, um, she teaches English, she teaches German and French and Spanish, her and along with her staff members. So you want to talk a little bit about that because she's offering Spanish courses um, virtually now. And this is something that's needed with the, the immigrants coming to Mexico and the expats. Yes, so let's talk about that. Um, the Academic Spanish program that I have set up is fairly new because it, um, I'm honest, I it, it became visual to me with the COVID situation and watching how many people are flooding to Mexico and not being and I've ready. I've been telling about it for a minute. Yes, you have. <laughs> I was too busy trying to focus on those pestos like, right now. Get this Spanish, get the get <laughs> Spanish courses, yeah. But there's a level of security. And like I, had, like I told you, I had to first figure out academic Spanish before I could teach it. Sure. So um, it's, a, it's a new course. It takes roughly seven months to be knowledgeable. I don't want anybody to ever to feel like they can learn a language in one year because you can't. You can be knowledgeable in that language, but you cannot be fluent in a year. That's just crazy. My thing is a working knowledge. I'm happy with a B1 level, yeah. A working knowledge um, is focused on vocabulary, local conversational skills, because we have to keep in mind that every state is different and every state has their own vocabulary. So um, we're working on vocabulary that is used, I would say, from the central to southern part of Mexico with a couple of vocabulary or wordisms from the north that we, we are fluent with. But the north, I think north of Mexico is really different with their Spanish because it has a lot of English influence. Oh yeah, it's different. Yeah, so it, it's completely different. But the the Spanish that I'm teaching is functional from Mexico, Mexico City. City Spanish is hard for me to follow. Living here in Veracruz, exactly. it's statico, and I it's not as nice. But of course, I love Veracruz, maybe because I live here. I love the Ver Veracruzans. To me, um, I think I was surrounded by a lot of them in the states, but Veracruz and Puebla. So I always associated the Mexican Spanish accent with singing. It's very sing songy to me, and that's not the case in the northern or Mexico City. It's it's no. more statico. It's like it's like that in Yucatan. In Yucatan, sí, se canta mucho cuando sí. cuando habla. Like, wow. But here, not. Um, do you want to sit down and have a conversation with us too? My husband's it's, back. So <laughs> he's back. Hey, you, Ivan. Hello. What do you say? He said no. A Leo no, being shy. No. Is a Leo being shy? It's our season. It's the Leo season. <laughs> he waved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm I'm coming. Um, get, Roxana, it's time for me to put my wife hat on. Okay, lunch time. So um, we can do part. We'll do another one later on. But mm -hmm. just finish up with your course. Tell tell us. Okay, so with the Spanish course. We're, we have worked it out where we have language or localisms, that's what they call localism, from Mexico City to Yucatan that will allow the person to function at a high level, you know, because you don't want people to, to think of you as a gringo in Mexico. I hate this word, but a gringo in Mexico. You want people to look at you as an educated American in Mexico. Okay. So in order to do that, you must understand the localisms 
the ideology of the, the, the verbiage here. And the course is, I don't think it's very expensive. I'm, I'm charging roughly 150 US dollars a month. Um, you have to sign, it's online. So you do have to sign your, your contract. And it, the class is one-on-one, -on -one, so it's personal. Um, I'm willing to, or I say I, but I as our company, our school, we are willing to spend time with you, not only your one hour a day, but also when you're in a situation and you need a, an efficient translation, we are here to do that for you. All right. Okay? All right. Because a lot, of people are, <laughs> yes, a lot of people are using Google and she is not your friend. Google is not your friend. So... <laughs> When you need a efficient translation, a one-on-one -on -one human translation, we as teachers are here to do that. We are available from nine o'clock in the morning to 11 p.m. at night for all our students. Okay. Okay. The Welsh English Learning Center. All right. You can you can get your Spanish lesson um, Spanish lessons from her. She described. Thank you very much, Rakia. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, for educating us on life here in Mexico, culture in Mexico. And we'll try to do a part two um, some months down the line because um, yes. there's much more that we could talk about. Yes, you know, I, I absolutely love it. So I'll try to give my husband a key in so that we can maybe do a couple of chats so he can give you. Yeah, I wanted him to come. I wanted you to come, Ivan. So next time I'll be looking out for you. It's his birthday season. So next time he can come and talk because he'll be one of your teacher's people. He's with the World yeah. English Learning Center, and I've been after him for three years for him to teach <laughs> Spanish for three years. So I'm happy that they've, they've, they're, they're continuing to expand their business, all right? So That's we'll see right. you online. And remember, I'm going to put the link to their business in the comments, so you'll be able to uh, click on the link and contact with Kia and Ivan directly. Thank you so much. This is Thank Roxana Bangura of the Roxana Bangura channel and the Bangura Chronicles on Patreon and Facebook, where me and my daughter, Amaris, share with you our life here in Mexico and beyond. Gracias. Muy amable. Gracias. Adios. Adios. Buen día. Okay, buen día.